Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see so many colleagues joining today, as well as many of our clients. This shows, of course, how important the climate change discussion and issue is to our people and to the sectors in which we work as a firm. We're delighted to be joined today by Simon Mundy, who I will introduce properly shortly. But first of all, I wanted to briefly set out why we have organized this webinar. Whenever there's a COP conference, there is always a lot of attention on the climate issue. But I think we all recognize that we need to maintain this fo focus year round, given the urgency of action. Therefore, COP provides a helpful focus for a discussion, but certainly when it comes to our firm, we're committed to the ongoing development and delivery of our own sustainability plan and continuing to learn from others along the way. For me, COP is always a reminder, if need be, um, of the urgency of climate change. Hearing from, the, from developing countries about the impact of climate change has been striking, and I'm sure we'll talk about the loss and damage developments later. However, it's clear this is an issue that is already having a huge impact globally, and we will all need to play our part in enabling and accelerating the green transition. This, of course, won't be a smooth and straightforward pro pro process, and I don't believe all the solutions can be driven at governmental level. Collaboration is key and businesses need to play their part. At WFW, for example, we're, ke we're keen to share our expertise to help inform the discussion on sector-based policy development. An example of this is our sustainability imperative report assessing where the world of shipping is in relation to sustainability, and we're looking forward to publishing an update to that early next year. We're also committed to walking the talk on sustainability across our operations. That includes getting independent verification of our global carbon footprint in order to set credible science-based targets and a clear carbon management plan for the firm and encouraging our colleagues to take on environmental pro bono matters, including working with the Legal Response Initiative to provide additional legal support for developing countries who were negotiating at COP27 and also at the Convention for Biological Diversity in Montreal next month. So to help us make, you know, to help us all make some sense of what's happened at COP, and to share some climate stories from the front line, I'm delighted to introduce Simon Mundy from the Financial Times and editor of Moral Money. Before I hand over to Simon, I would like to encourage all of you to leave any questions um, for him at the, for, for the end of the session uh, and to let us know who you are and where you're from. These questions will be picked up uh, after Simon has finished his presentation, and we anticipate that we could have up to 20 minutes of uh, Q&A at the end. So with, um, with that, I'd like to hand over to, to Simon now. Thank you very much, George, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. So to briefly introduce myself, I've been a journalist with the Financial Times for a bit over 12 years now. And I'm not actually an environmental journalist by background. I'm a foreign correspondent, primarily. I, I worked in South Africa, South Korea, and in India. And it was in India um, that I was really introduced to, the, to this subject in a really serious way, in a way that really changed the course of, of my career. Um, and that was what um, ended up setting me on this path um, that led me to, to COP27 this year. Um, so I'd like to share with you a bit about, um, about the COP and, and the things that I took away from it in the context of the, the book that I wrote, which, which I think is what attracted the attention of, of WFW and led to this, this kind invitation today. Uh, so hopefully by sharing some of the stories from that book, as well as some of the stories that I encountered at COP27, um, I might be able to, to provide some, some useful food for thought today. So as I mentioned, it was soon after I moved to India that my eyes were really opened to the scale of this crisis and of this story. I had heard about a, a drought happening in, in Western India, um, which was the, the region that I was based in. It still required a, a fairly long journey to get to the area in question, an overnight train from Mumbai, out into this area called Maratwada. 
And what I found there on the ground was was very shocking indeed. Uh, people were losing their their livelihoods in enormous numbers. I, I walked through fields that were just covered in in the rotting remains of of dead plants. I, I walked through the the the, um, the the floors of reservoirs that no longer had a single drop of moisture to be seen. And it was the first time that my my eyes had really been opened to the fact that. This is something that is really happening right now. We often fall into this trap of talking about the climate crisis in terms of what will happen in the future. Um, but right now, all over the world, people are feeling the, the effects with really uh, with full force. And so the more that I started to become aware of this, the more I realized that it was not only the physical impacts of climate change that are really upending everything in the world today. This is something which is cascading through the world, through geopolitics. Um, and the more I looked into that, I thought, well, this is simply the biggest story of our time, the biggest story for me as a journalist um, to be looking at. And that was something which I decided I wanted to, to really dedicate myself to in a more serious way. So the idea for the book, um, it came about really off the back of a conversation with someone who works in the publishing industry. And I think this is what sowed the, the, the idea in my mind. This person was talking about how people don't tend to read books about the climate crisis. They find it a very heavy subject. It can be very overwhelming. People don't like to be preached at. Um, and the way in which I decided to tackle it was rather different. It was based around a journey, a journey which ended up taking me two years through 26 countries on six different continents, meeting people who in a huge range of different ways are involved in this crisis, whether they're responding to the worst impacts of it or coming up with some of the amazing solutions that we do have available to us in tackling it. And so I'd like to share some of those stories with you here today. And let's see if I can get the screen sharing function to work. Here we go. Um, so I hope everyone can see the, the photograph that I'm sharing from my screen. On the left, this is a man called Ali Muhammad, who's someone who's featured in my book. And I met him in a place called Afa in northeastern Ethiopia. And this is one of the very poorest places that I've ever been to. And it, but it's it's somewhere that for many, many years, people had a sustainable way of life. They managed to, um, to, to live in, in harmony with their, with their surroundings by raising cattle, uh, goats, uh, and camels. And, and these were the, the, the basis of their, of their livelihoods. Um, today, all of the cattle have gone and most of the goats too. Um, so the, the camels have, have proved hardiest. This is a part of the world where people are dealing with, with serious droughts, um, coupled with the impact of locust infestations, which are driven by the impact of cyclones, which are uh, devastating Arabia and creating the breeding conditions for, for locusts in huge numbers. And I, I think it's important to, um, for me to start my presentation today by just making clear how serious some of these effects are because this is something which is often hidden from us this is something happening far away in very poor places and it's not featured in the news very much it's quite an effort for um for even just for a journalist to get out there um but fundamentally this underscores the reasons why this is this is not something that we can afford to neglect any longer and the the stories that I encountered in Ethiopia were unfortunately mirrored by communities that I met in many other parts of the world also. Gandli here um, lives in the Solomon Islands. This is uh, in the South Pacific, um, quite, a, quite a long way to the, to the east of Australia. Gandli here is, is standing on the site of his former home. This is um, a part of the world which, due to variations in trade winds, has been hit by the impacts of climate change in terms of rising sea levels much earlier than the rest of the world. And it gives us a, a foretaste of, of things that will be happening elsewhere too. Um, in very different ways, 
uh, in Mongolia. This was really an extraordinary privilege to be able to, to visit Mongolia in the winter to meet people like Gombo, who, who's shown in this photograph that I took. Mongolia illustrates just how dangerous a game it is that we're playing with the climate. Because climate change on average, of course, is driving an increase in the global average temperature, but it's coming with some very strange and unpredictable effects too. The, the winters in Mongolia are becoming much more severe. It seems to be linked to changes in the Arctic sea ice. As the Arctic sea ice melts, it creates shifts and distortions in the movement of heat energy and moisture across the, the Northern Hemisphere. In Bangladesh, I visited communities that are being uprooted from their rice farming culture in the southwest of the country and forced to move in very large numbers to the slums of Dhaka. This sort of climate migration, again, it's happening quite out of sight and out of mind for many of us in the rich world. Um, but this is something we won't be shielded from forever. And I invite people to consider what large scale climate migration might mean for politics in the Western world. I imagine that if you're a fascist politician in Europe or, or in other parts of the developed world, you might be seeing an opportunity here to drive a very nasty sort of far right politics in response to this crisis. This is not something that we in the rich world will be, will be insulated from. Um, and I think this is something that uh, really forces us to consider how, how we view ourselves as a global civilization and the extent to which we are willing to um, to come to the assistance of others in the in the developing world. And so this all really comes down to a, a principle, a question, which was at the center of the conversation this year at COP27, climate justice. Um, this is a young woman called Joanna Sustento, who I featured at some length in my book, and I took this photo of her when she was protesting outside the Philippines headquarters of Shell in downtown Manila. And Joanna lost almost her entire family to a typhoon, Typhoon Haiyan, in 2013. And the reason why she was protesting outside Shell is because in the previous year, Shell paid out more money to its shareholders than any other company in the world, $16 billion, that's much more than second placed Apple. Um, and its chief executive and $62,000 per day. And from Joanna's point of view, this is something which was only possible because of a fundamental failing in the way that the global economy works. There are costs that are imposed by the pollution from fossil fuels, including those um, produced by Shell, and yet those costs are not being paid in, in a meaningful way by the companies or by their shareholders, they're being paid by people like Joanna's family. And so at COP27, was this problem fixed? Well, of course it wasn't. Um, and yet I was quite encouraged to see the increasing force with which people from developing countries were putting their case. Um, and that of course led to the, the landmark decision to establish a loss and damage facility, which is supposedly going to be set up by next year. Now, loss and damage is a term that many people might not have been that familiar with before COP27, but it's something which has been pushed for by various developing countries for a very long time. In fact, I was five years old when the Association of Small Island States, largely from the Pacific, started pushing for this in 1991. Um, they started pushing for serious talks on effectively compensation or assistance in which developing countries are being forced to bear in such a huge way. And finally, this year, for the very first time at the 27th annual COP conference, finally, it was formally placed on the agenda. And many thought that it still wouldn't lead to anything much. Um, but there was an agreement to set up a, a fund. Um, now, does that amount to climate justice? Well, I don't think it does. The, um, the climate minister of, of Pakistan called it an investment in climate justice, which I think is, is one way of putting it. But fundamentally, as long as we have an economic system 
that does not impose an appropriate cost on carbon, then not only is it not just, but frankly, we are not going to get to net zero. And so how did that side of things go? Well, this, this man um, has been blamed by many for throwing a cog in the mitigation or energy transition side of things at COP27. Um, this is Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman. He's the son of the Saudi king and the Saudi energy minister, who is therefore uh, effectively the most powerful man in the global energy industry. And I met him in Riyadh last year um, when I was researching the Saudi book. Um, and we had a, a very long conversation. He, he, um, he spoke to me for three hours in his office. His, um, his aides kept on trying to wrap things up, but he, he, didn't, he was well into his, into his stride. The message that he was sending is that Saudi Arabia is not going to be left behind. They see the way the wind is blowing. They understand that the, move, the world is moving away from fossil fuels and they want to be a part of that transition. So you can see there's a, a solar banner behind him. Um, this was actually the second time I met him during my visit where he was uh, overseeing a huge ceremony for the, for the launch of I think eight new solar farms in various parts of the country. And of course it makes perfect sense for the Saudis to invest heavily in solar power. They do have a solar resource potential that is second only to the world's great deserts. They have enormous potential for, for so in turn to make green hydrogen, which they hope they can then export to the rest of the world um, using the, their expertise in exporting conventional energy. But at COP27, um, even though they, they were talking this game in a very big way, they had the, the biggest national pavilion at the conference, over a thousand square meters, compared to, for example, Angola only had nine square meters and many countries didn't have a pavilion at all. Um, and they were using this, this pavilion, of course, to, to present this, this message. But for their critics, the most important thing was what they did um, on the language in the final text around the use of oil and gas. And this is one thing which I, cops, I found it quite amazing the squeamishness and the lack of straight talking around fossil fuels. At COP26 last year, for the very first time, the phrase fossil fuel appeared in a closing text for a COP conference. Until then, they'd never been mentioned in these long, long texts, which can be 10 pages or more, no mention of them at all. And last year, even then, it didn't say we agreed that we should stop using fossil fuels. It said, we agree to phase down the use of unabated coal power. So that just means coal power where you don't capture and store the, the carbon, as well as inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Um, so presumably efficient fossil fuel subsidies were fine. Um, so that was obviously very mealy mouthed language. And there were hopes that this year it could be strengthened. One suggestion which gained the support of more than 85 countries came from India. And that suggestion was that basically the language should just be broadened to include other fossil fuels as well. There should be a phase down of all fossil fuels. Um, and the Saudis were um, widely blamed. I, I don't know precisely how, how fair um, this is, but many participants blamed the Saudis and other big oil producers for, for blocking this. So, so that raised in the, the eyes of a lot of people um, concerns about the COP process. You'll, you'll hear people saying that maybe it's a, it's a waste of time. Maybe we, we shouldn't um, be going forward with, with COPs um, in the way that we are. I personally think it's very valuable to have an annual meeting where countries are forced to come together and are held accountable. I think it's better that this thing should be in a very high profile setting rather than all this sorts of uh, negotiations happening in the in the shadows and i also think we we should give some credit to the negotiators who did manage to come up with a unanimous agreement among more than 190 different countries in the space of a couple of weeks that is that is meaningful and it reaffirms the fact that this is a unique and unprecedented crisis that affects every country in the world, which every country in the world is going to have 
a part in addressing. And it seems to me entirely appropriate that there should be a get together every year of governments from around the world to address it. Whether we should also have this sort of trade fair that has sprung up around it with so many uh, panel discussions and, and marketing booths. There was a Canadian company called CGI, which had one of the biggest pavilions at the whole conference to promote the metaverse. I'm not sure this sort of thing is, is valuable. One excellent um, Ghanaian activist uh, suggested to me, why not have the fun fair separate from the negotiations? And that seems like a, a good idea to me. Um, but one of the other things which became clear to me during my travels and which has only been reaffirmed to me since is just how much potential there is for the private sector to play a really exciting role in this. I think fundamentally we need to be looking to, to governments to update the rules of the game. Um, this is absolutely essential, as um, the former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson told me during my book research very bluntly. He said, look, the rules of the economic game are out of date. We don't have a price on carbon. We have to update this. But the governments can only really set the rules and provide the incentives. Um, and one thing that's very exciting for me is to see the amount of innovation and technological advice in the private sector. Um, I took a drone with me um, everywhere on my travels, and I took this photo using the drone at a place called Helles Havi in Iceland. And this is a project that many of you might have heard about, um, which involves sucking carbon dioxide from the air. And it's happening at this geothermal power plant in Iceland um, under the leadership of Edda Aradotter, who runs a company called Carbfix. They have a partner, uh, which is a Zurich-based company named Climeworks. And together they've built this system that sucks carbon dioxide from normal air. It passes air through a membrane inside a box. The carbon dioxide sticks to this membrane. When it's saturated, the box closes, they heat it up. Carbon dioxide comes out. They pump it underground, mixed with water. And underground, it binds with the Icelandic volcanic bedrock and forms limestone. And it's, it's quite extraordinary when one stops and thinks about it. For many hundreds of years, up solid stuff from underground, burning it, turning it into gas that heats up our planet. This is turning that into reverse, taking that carbon gas, turning it into stone where it sits inert and underground. Um, and this is just one example of the exciting work that's happening in the private sector. It does also point to the need for additional government intervention, perhaps, because there's not much of a market at the moment for the service that Carbfix and Climeworks provide. Um, if you want to offset your carbon emissions, as you probably know, you can buy offsets for a dollar a ton, various online providers. It's completely unregulated market and the offsets that you buy for a dollar a ton are typically avoidance or reduction based offsets which might work something like this i buy a forest in brazil in an area that has a lot of deforestation um i make sure that it doesn't burn down and then i sell you carbon credits because i say that if i didn't protect the forest probably it would burn down and therefore you are avoiding carbon emissions Having been through the Amazon, that's another place that I um, visited, of course, for the book, and I, I met people who are burning down the rainforest. It strikes me that if you protect one area of forest, they'll quite happily go up and burn the next one. So I have some concerns about the avoidance-based offset system that is currently dominant. Um, in order for the incentive to be created to buy offsets from people like Edda, it strikes me that some form of tighter standards, probably through government regulation, would be needed. But the point is that all over the world, some of the most ambitious and smartest entrepreneurs are diving into this space. This is Hu Xiaopeng, who I met in Guangzhou, and he's the head of one of the biggest Chinese electric car companies. He actually became a billionaire, um, not in this space, but in the, the internet space. He created 
a company called UC Web, which created China's most popular mobile browser, sold it for a very large amount of money to Alibaba, and then found himself as a senior executive at Alibaba, one of the, the biggest um, tech companies, digital e-commerce uh, companies in the world. Um, so you'd, you'd say he was set for life, but he decided that that wasn't where the really exciting action was at. In China at the moment, um, he told me and other un Chinese entrepreneurs that I met while I was there, told me if you really want to go into a high growth sector with massive long, long term potential in China, it's clean tech. And why? It's not because Xi Jinping is some sort of angel who wants but one thing that the Chinese Com Communist Party has recognized is that they have this extraordinary potential to be an energy superpower, maybe the number one energy superpower in the clean energy era. And so from that point of view, if you tie your wagon to that area of Chinese strategic priority, then it seems like a pretty sure bet that that, that area is going to grow. It's far less clear, of course, which companies are going to emerge victorious within that. There's been fierce competition. But Xiaopang is, is one of those companies that, that has been succeeding since I met. They, they went public in, in New York. It remains to be seen, of course, how far the increasingly difficult geopolitical relationship between China and the US, as well as other Western countries, will get in the way of that. Um, in the US itself, um, I was quite bowled over by, by the cutting edge technology being, being developed by some of the, the companies that I visited. Um, so Bob Mumgard here, he's actually standing next to, this is a very old machine, as you can probably see, this was built in, in the 1980s at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. When this was switched on, it was the hottest point in the whole solar system, 100 million degrees Celsius. It's a fusion reactor. Um, the trouble is that it could only be switched on for a very short period, and it consumed far more power than it gave off, so useless as a power station. What Bob is now building, and he's raised a $1.8 billion Series B round to do it, is what he hopes will be the first fusion reactor that will give off more power than it takes in, and that would usher in the age of fusion power. That would be the first working fusion power station. And I caught up with him again a couple of months ago, um, went to this enormous site in Massachusetts where they're building this thing for an FT film that we're making, which should be out in, in January. So keep an eye out for that. And I, I said to him, Bob, if you do what you're trying to do, if you hit your targets, then where we're standing now will be a major historical site for human civilization. And uh, he just turned to me and sort of shrugged and said, yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> And this is just one example of the companies that are pushing forward the most incredibly exciting potential solutions to this. I don't know if Bob's going to manage to do what he's trying to do, but there are many, many more of him out there. And so from my point of view, if any of us, if we have the potential to take part in this extraordinary challenge, and, and play a serious part in, in addressing it, then, then it's a privilege to be part of something so exciting. But at the same time as, as it's exciting, it's also extremely complicated. And I think one thing that COP27 really bore out is that there are going to be no easy answers. I don't pretend to have simple and easy answers. And that, that was something which was really underscored for me um, when I visited the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which is one of the biggest countries in Africa, and it's also by far the world's biggest producer of cobalt. And cobalt is incredibly important to the energy transition because it's a fundamental ingredient in most of the lithium ion batteries that power the world's electric cars. And as I saw for myself on the ground, um, this, this is a very problematic industry. A lot of the, the cobalt that's produced in Congo is dug out of these, these underground mines. To my knowledge, I'm the only um, foreigner who's been inside one of these informal mines where I took this photo um, with a miner called Mangovo. 
um and it's it's very dangerous and scary down there um you know i just went down there 15 minutes i I can only imagine what it's like going down there all day every day the mines frequently collapse um you can you if you, if you slip while getting down there you would certainly break a lot of bones because it's a it's a sheer drop of about 40 feet where you have to crawl down or uh, uh, sort of edge your way down like a victorian chimney sweep with your bare hands and feet and this is somewhere where thousands of of people spend their days um many of them many of them children um so one young person i met who fortunately now is being helped by an ngo and she's training as you can see to be a seamstress but letitia um like many young young children in congo um did spend a lot of time working at a mine site and so the the question this raises for me this is not simply a matter of shutting down congo's informal mines one has to ask the question of why young people like Letitia and indeed adults like Mangovo are working in such terrible conditions. And that for me really points to an opportunity that we have to build a truly better global economy, something which is being forced upon us to a certain extent. The climate crisis has made clear to us that we have to move away from fossil fuels. It's, it's, that's no longer an optional thing. We are cooking the planet. We have to fundamentally rethink the way that we generate our energy. But as we undertake that really root and branch reconsideration of the way that our energy systems work, that's an incredible opportunity to take stock of so many other things too and think about how we can tackle at the same time these much broader problems of injustice and and the challenge of sustainable development that is is no less urgent um and it's an incredible opportunity as we saw at cop 27 um that opportunity is is not being taken as as rapidly and wholeheartedly as we would hope but it's very much there and it's something that i as a journalist feel very privileged to be able to dedicate my days to covering um, so I will pause there and I'd be very interested to hear any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Simon, thank you very much for, for that. I mean, it was I, I found it hugely interesting, you know, the way you described your journey, you know, where you came from, that this wasn't particularly your area, but, you know, how this has inspired you, how you've been around the world and, and what you've seen. So that that to me was hugely interesting you know your motivation for this and and also sort of spreading the message of what's happening around the world um i also found you know hugely interesting your analysis of you know what's happened what happened at cop the fact that while it may not be the ideal forum it's better than anything else you know we currently have and also the challenge of, of actually making that step to get more than 190 countries to sign up to something. And also the 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 entrepreneurial um, moves and developments um, that, you know, that as well is is hugely interesting. And also the the interaction. And this is, you know, sort of a, a question I have, because I think, you, you know, you've said this and many people say this, that, well, you there is an opportunity for the private sector but at the same time you do need government intervention and you know how how does one reach that perfect point where where those two are harnessed to produce the the, the you know the best results the results that take this take this forward um and you know what are the motivations when you have for example you know you you described saudi arabia being resistant to 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 change or potentially because you, you don't know exactly if it is them but but you know so so for me that that's hugely interesting as well yeah no so i think to your point about the division of labor as it were between the private and public sectors between companies and governments um i think at the moment there is not enough focus on what governments need to do I mean, the the thing which any economist will tell you is needed at this point is a serious carbon pricing regime. We already have carbon pricing in all sorts of forms all over the world, but it's clearly not rigorous enough. And so it strikes me that um, 
you know, the investment and innovation is going to have to come primarily from the private sector, but the incentives have to be mm -hmm. created. And clearly the incentives are not sufficiently there. You can still make a lot of money in, in the current world economy from thermal coal. There are, there are economic incentives to invest in thermal coal in many parts of the world. Um, and while there are economic incentives to invest in renewables, they're not powerful enough to drive an energy transition at the scale we need. So how do we fix that? Well, carbon pricing and other forms of government action to shift the, the rules of the game, um, I think, are absolutely essential. And it, it surprises me that it's not a hotter debate um, than it is. But one thing that I've noticed, which has been quite interesting, is when I see long term projections from various sorts of financial and industry analysts, increasingly they're factoring in really serious carbon pricing for let's say 10 years from now so there's there's already an assumption um from various people in the private sector that that is coming and i think um those those investors and companies that are making these sorts of really long-term investments that will be sensitive to such things would be quite imprudent if they assumed that the approach to carbon pricing will remain as it is now Having said that, it's not guaranteed that governments will act on this sort of thing. I mean, we just had a very short-lived British government, but a British government nonetheless, which was very, um, which was very hostile to to all sorts of green initiatives. Which even even those which various, um, which a lot of big companies would want to, see, no means a sure thing that we'll have these these rules coming in. We don't know what's going to happen at the next U.S. general election. We don't know if the current European Union zeal for for green action will will be sustained so nothing can be taken for granted but i think fundamentally i i do think paulson had a point where he just said the rules of the game are out of date we need to update them we need to have a serious price on carbon um and then you can get around some of these issues with fiduciary duty i'm sure a lot of um lawyers at your firm and elsewhere have been paying a lot of attention to these issues around fiduciary duty because there are serious questions um, which have been raised by Republican politicians and others who are saying, if you're pursuing a particular area, a particular target um, for net zero emissions, let's say a 2050 net zero target, and, and you're an investment manager, and you are optimizing your portfolio for that, and the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says that, that scenario is unlikely, you may not be serving the best interests of your clients. And, and these are the sort of situations where you get into where the economic incentives are not sufficient, but the governments can, can affect that. And maybe that's what we need to focus on. And then the governments can say to the private sector, okay, we've set up the rules of the game, such as the, the incentives are in the right place. And now you can go off and focus on making money and the incentives are aligned. Okay. But how, I mean, you know, you said that the market, let's say, has priced in the fact that there will be these carbon credits in the next 10 years. Do you think that's the realistic sort of scenario and timeline? Yeah, I I, I think, I, I hope it will be nearer than, than 10 years. I think this is the sort of thing where you can see, you you could imagine it coming into, into force much, much more swiftly. Um, it's just not something that I, I would count on. But I, I think it's something which um, companies and indeed citizens can be a bit more forceful. And we, we often talk about business lobbying sort of with the assumption that business lobbying or, always has to be nefarious and underhand and sinister. Um, business lobbying just amounts to businesses communicating either privately or publicly the things that they would like to see. And I think if you had a really concerted um, approach from various businesses, not only thinking about what they can do with their own biz with their own uh, operations, but also just communicating publicly and openly saying, these are the sorts of things that we think would be helpful for the economy and they'd be manageable for our business, so be it carbon pricing or various other sorts of green, green measures. Um, because I, I do think that when it comes to um, when it comes to these, these sorts of decisions, governments pay attention to the voice of big business. And it can give great political cover if there's a, a government, political leaders who, who are wondering whether or not um, to move ahead with ambitious green policies. 
if there are there's a, a decent voice coming from decent uh, collection of voices coming from the private sector saying we'd be comfortable with these measures then it increases the chances of it happening okay thank you simon i i'll hand over now to to ben um who's who's going to look at the questions which have come in and direct them to you thanks george and thanks simon for a uh, fascinating talk it's really really interesting um we've got a question which i think picks on something that that we've talked about previously around sort of um mitigation versus adaptation so andrew ward's asking what's your view on on whether the discussion around loss and damage uh risk distracting from agreeing solutions for for improving the future um or do, do, should those two go hand in hand yeah, there, there is a risk of that. And, um, you know, I would personally celebrate the, the progress on loss and damage, because it is something that developing countries have been pushing for for such a long time, they think it's needed, they're, they're the ones who are really at the sharp end of this. So from that point of view, I do think it's a positive development. I also think it's interesting, this this suggestion that some people have been putting out there, which which is that this really changes the, the dynamic, because now, to some extent, the rich countries are on the hook for these costs in a way that they were not before. They're not admitting legal liability. Um, you know, if we imagine the sums of money that would be involved if the US or the UK agreed to make good on its contribution to climate change and to the impact on developing countries, these sums would be enormous. We're not going to see sums anything like that. And yet, to some extent, the rich countries have put themselves on the hook. It gives them an additional incentive um, to move more quickly on mitigation. So you could take that approach to it. Um, but I agree that it risks being a distraction. We are talking about um, money that will go towards repairs and, and and towards cleaning up after terrible disasters. That's what loss and damage fund will be for. You know, the priority has to be to stop this this damage and this loss of life and and livelihood from happening in the first place. And that can only happen through a much more ambitious approach to to what we call mitigation to to reducing carbon emissions. Um, and clearly that ambition is not there. You know, I've always thought as a journalist, when you're dealing with these sort of in, intergovernmental statements and uh, agreements, that sometimes we can get bizarrely um, excited over small changes in language. You might remember that Alok Sharma was reduced to the verge of tears last year at COP26, seemingly by a decision to change that wording around phasing um, it was it was going to be phase out unabated coal. It was changed to phase down, and he became he, he was he was very upset by that, and and that reflects the fact that this this sort of language does matter. Actually, it really sets the direction of travel. It sets the tone for what happens later. The Paris Agreement, for example, had a, a huge galvanizing effect. It it sets the terms of reference for everything that happens outside COPs. So I think that's the way to think about these things. It's it's not about imagining that suddenly we will get some world-saving breakthrough in the space of a two-week conference, but it sets the terms of reference. It makes clear what countries consider acceptable and no longer acceptable. I think another thing which passed relatively less noticed um, actually out of that COP statement was around the multilateral development banks. I think this is something which anyone who's interested in the, the investment flows around here should pay a lot of attention to because um, it's very clear there's not enough climate related finance going into developing countries. It's very clear that what would make a big difference is multilateral development banks, and in particular, the World Bank, getting involved to crowd in, as they say, private finance to take the, the first lost tranche or whatever it might be to, to de-risk these investments. Um, and what was interesting um, about the, the COP27 statement is it really put the pressure on these MDBs. The World Bank in particular has been under a lot of pressure, a lot of criticism from people saying that it's not going far enough and fast enough. Um, the World Bank has been basically pushing back and saying it's doing fine. Um, the COP, at COP27, the countries came together to say multilateral development banks are going to have to rethink their game. And that, for all sorts of people in the private sector, whether it's law firms, whether it's investment firms and banks and financial firms of all sorts, 
um, as well as companies in what they call the real economy, um, are going to see enormous opportunities opening up if those MDBs do follow through under that pressure and up their game. Thank you. And we've had a question which I think is, is sort of um, bigger picture stuff in terms of the, the geopolitical uh, situation that we find ourselves in and, and, and how that has an impact on, on climate progress. So the question around whether energy security is fire up in the discussions at COP from your perspective this year and, and I guess more broadly, do, do you think that what we're seeing now in terms of um, energy being being used within within the situation we're in will ultimately be be a hindrance or, or or can it be a spur for progress yeah i mean i was i was having a conversation with someone at cop about you know which individual has had the biggest galvanizing impact on the climate conversation over the past 20 years and i said i probably have to say greta thunberg and this person said no it's vladimir putin and you know the argument being that this has dramatically accelerated the momentum behind the the energy transition and i stopped and thought and i said you might be right actually um, and then I said, well, the greatest intentional positive impact would not be him. But um, in terms of unintentional Im impacts, the, the energy transition, the, the logic behind it has received this enormous push, not, especially in Europe, but not only in Europe. In the short term, obviously, you're seeing coal plants being fired back up. And, uh, and this is a very, very unfortunate development. Um, I think it was interesting. Um, I mentioned the short-lived Liz Truss government. I, I think she was really making the case that given the energy crisis, we have to sideline net zero commitments. We have to focus on expanding fossil fuel production. We have to, to really um, go all out to, to shore up our domestic fossil fuel production and put climate concerns to one side. And more than 190 countries unanimously agreed that that's not okay. That there, that, that there was some quite strong language in the text saying there must be no backsliding in response to the current energy crisis, which I thought was quite striking. That was not necessarily going to be going to be in there. So you've got a commitment there that the uh, the, the Russian invasion is not going to derail progress on this. Will it nonetheless lead to some backtracking and backsliding? I think in some cases that's obviously already been happening, as I mentioned, coal plants being fired up in Germany and Italy and so on. Um, but in the long run, I think the the case for renewable investment just got a, a really important new buttressing factor there. So we, we've talked quite a bit about um, about energy on, on the call. We've talked about um, finance and then we've got lots of uh, clients from the finance world on the call. Um, transport is also a big a big sector for us, and I just wondered if you had any observations, particularly from a maritime or aviation perspective, um, either based on your your current reporting, anything within the book, um, and how those sectors, the role those sectors are playing in the transition and challenges and opportunities there. Yeah, so I dealt with this a bit in the book with a couple of um, sustainable fuel companies. Um, so one of them is called Lanza Tech in the US, and the other one's called Sunfire in Germany. Um, and both of these are really focusing not so much on, um, you know, reinventing the way that these engines work, but more in terms of a sustainable way of providing hydrocarbon fuels. So why is this? Well, it's to do with density. So jet fuel is an extraordinarily dense form of energy. Um, you know, it's, it's miraculous when you think about it. You can have these, these incredibly heavy pieces of metal flying hundreds of people from one side of the Atlantic to the other. And that's only possible because of the incredible density of jet fuel. If you were going to use lithium ion batteries for that, you would need um, batteries that would be many, many times the size and weight um, of the plane itself. It just wouldn't be practical. There are um, There is work happening with electric planes, but they would only be for much, much shorter distances that there is no one developing uh, an intercontinental electric plane. Um, people talk about the, the, the possibilities of hydrogen, um, but again, I mean, this is something which is seen as many years away. But what's interesting is that already there are ways of producing um, hydrocarbon fuel, jet fuel or other forms of hydrocarbons in a much less 
environmentally disastrous way. So what Lanzatech do is they would capture um, the, the carbon from uh, from waste in various forms of industrial or municipal waste, and they can um, turn that with the they have this um, amazing microbe they discovered in rabbit guts, um, which it turns out can be used for these these purposes. Sunfire in Germany have a very different approach where they can use the fischer tropsch reactions. So you can take CO2 from the air, mix it with hydrogen derived from, from water, and you end up forming, um, forming hydrocarbons, jet fuel. Um, so in theory, the Sunfire process, for example, um, they're working on a project in collaboration with Climeworks, who I mentioned that project in Iceland, um, where you would take that carbon dioxide from the air, and in instead of turning it into stone underground, you turn it into jet fuel, and you end up with a, a circular process. So this is this is happening, this is being developed. I think that's where a lot of the attention is certainly for, for aviation. Um, for maritime transport, uh, there, there's there's more potential there for hydrogen ammonia. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting to note there is Maersk, the biggest container shipping company in the world. Um, really, I would say I would give them credit for showing quite bold leadership on this because when you're a company of that size, you can really reshape your supply chains just by giving a signal to the market saying we. Are providing the demand for this. So Maersk said they would be net zero in their shipping operations by 2050, which is really not that long away in, 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 when you consider how, how massive a reshaping of their, of their business that would mean. But that sends the signal to the entire supply chain that services the entire global shipping industry thinking, right, okay, well, there's demand for this now. There's a market for it because Maersk has set themselves this very difficult target. They've been open about the fact they don't know how they're going to get there. Um, but I think that was a really interesting example of a single very big company just deciding to throw a hand grenade into the whole situation um and and really driving quite disruptive change and we're, we're still seeing how that's playing out right now i think that's interesting in terms of um being open around ambiguity as well and complexity i think when we start talking about net zero and looking at the science-based targets initiative guidance around that now looking at 90 percent reduction across all of your scopes before you start looking at high quality offsets um, from my perspective, from my perspective as the firm, we're talking about decarbonisation first, because that sets out the principles for us in terms of taking our own action and then looking at some of the some of the tech that you talked about in terms of um, of, of good quality offsets. Um, but yeah, and, and I do I do sometimes think about that disconnect between the large companies doing great innovative stuff in the space and then the small the smaller companies that need to play their part. Um, and I wondered actually if you had any thoughts from that sort of upskilling perspective you know how can we bring together uh, the business community particularly those those smaller companies that maybe need a bit of additional support on on the journey yeah well i think the you know the example i just gave that sends a signal not only to the the suppliers but also to the investors if you were wondering whether whether or not to invest in a company that's coming up with some sort of low carbon solution for shipping then that announcement from Maersk would have fundamentally changed the way that whole sector looks to you as an investor. Um, something that we're focusing on um, at the FT is the, the need to really focus on the positives and the opportunities around this. So, you know, I think it's important, as I just did, to, to emphasize the reasons why this is so important. The, you know, the fact that um, there are people who are already suffering very seriously from the impacts of climate change and that it's it's unfortunately going to get worse unless we really, really act fast. But it's also important to really stress the opportunities that are available. So I think, you know, it, we we often talk about this in negative terms. We need to pollute less. We need to do less of this and less of that. It's also possible to conceive of the whole thing in positive terms. Think how can we as a company maximize our contribution towards this great historic challenge? And how can we maximize our exposure to the opportunities that are here? I think you know, just that, that, that switch from thinking about it in terms of negatives to thinking about it in terms of positives can, can be quite powerful in some contexts. And I'm conscious of time, but um, on that note, we're, we're talking about some, some very big structural and, and systemic challenges and opportunities. 
Um, many people, I think, feel um, a little bit overwhelmed about that sometimes in terms of, well, as an individual, what, what can I do? And, and, and I know that that, that discussion can be um, quite divisive, actually, in terms of being, being weaponised on different sides of the argument. Um, and I was curious in, in terms of your views on what individuals can do. So thinking about someone working in a law firm, for example, could be a lawyer, could be um, one of our business functions colleagues. What sort of things do you think that, that people can be doing um, to, to make a difference for, on a sort of individual level? Yeah, absolutely. I think people often talk about the three C's. Um, so that's the first one being what you can do as a consumer, second one, what you can do in your career, the third, what you can do as a citizen. Um, I think the first one is overdone. Of course, we can we can have an impact if we all um, collaboratively and uh, you know in a coordinated way eat less meat, fly less. These things can make a difference. But look, we saw during the the coronavirus pandemic, during the lockdowns, what happens when we just all bring our consumption down to the minimum? You know, really not. It didn't fix the problem of carbon emissions, did it? Carbon emissions only went down by about five percent in twenty twenty. So the consumer side, I think, gets overdone. Um, I think on the citizen side, it's important to remember that, you know, we all have our, um, our day jobs, we are all also citizens, and we can use our voices, um, we can use our votes, we can we can engage with our, our elected representatives with our peers, we can get involved in democracy in our own way. Um, and, and of course, um, for, for companies as well, as I mentioned, through through companies lobbying activities, they can also um, have their impact and do have an impact there as well. But to your particular question about what people can do in their in their jobs in terms of their their careers, I mean it depends so much um, on on individual circumstances and the, the particular sort of business that one works in. Um, I think there are a lot of um, that th th there's an increasing volume of of legal disputes happening at the moment which companies can get involved in in all sorts of ways. Um, and they can be on the right or the wrong side of history, by the way. I mean, you do have lawyers acting for the bad actors. In this. I think if I were a lawyer, my first priority would be to make sure that I wouldn't do anything that I'd be ashamed to tell my grandchildren about in, in 40 years time or whatever. Because um, a lot of these cases are being fought and it's pretty clear who's on the right side of history and who's not. Um, but that, that's, that's table stakes, as they say. Um, one one thing I'd I'd say is that um, so so within that there's there's more litigation happening. There's there's interesting things happening at the international law level as well. There's a, a gathering push for an international non-proliferation treaty, which is going to be really interesting. Uh, Vanuatu, along with a whole bunch of other countries, including Germany and Singapore, is is going before the international or, or is trying to move the UN General Assembly to take this to the the International Court of Justice, which would be a major development, which could uh, reshape the um, the legal uh, situation in terms of international law. I think that, if I were a lawyer, I'd find that fascinating to watch, and I think all sorts of legal things could follow from that. But the the, the main thing I'd I'd really stress, I think, is that you know there are many people in the world who, in their work, can't really have that much of an impact on this. I mean, you, you know, there's all, all sorts of jobs where where really the impact that you can have on the climate crisis is quite limited. But actually, if you're a lawyer, there, there are so many opportunities. You know, similarly for me as a journalist, um, there are huge opportunities. And I think that's a privilege. And I think it's it's important not to waste that. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, from our perspective, thinking about how we can use our skills in the best possible way, looking at pro bono, looking at the some of the, the community partnerships that we have to, to make the best use of our time from that, that perspective is um, is something we're really focused on. So as a quick call to action for colleagues before I hand back to George, please look at our pro bono portal um, for the latest opportunities and get involved with that. But we have run over time um, predictably. There's too much to talk about on this topic, but thanks so much, Simon. I'll hand back to George to close. Yeah, and Simon, thank you. That was That was hugely interesting and inspiring as well. Um, and as Ben said, we could we could you know carry on speaking for another hour at least on this. Um, and and you're certainly someone who could do that quite easily, and 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 you know delve into other other topics as well. So, you know, all the you know, I really would like you to thank you for the the presence today uh, and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, and you know, with that, I'll just bring this session to to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Simon.